I want to welcome you to our service on December 27th, um, the, week, the weekend after Christmas. Um, because of that, we're going to do something a little bit different. A, a traditional lessons and carol service is what you might expect, but this is some readings and carols uh, for us to think about as we meditate on Christmas today. And we're doing this mainly through our technology so that those of you as at home and can participate uh, with us in this. Well, why don't we pray together before we start our service this morning? Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that as uh, people um, gather either at home or in person at the church, Lord, that you would bless us, that you would help us to be able to reflect on your birth through these carols and these readings. We pray that your spirit would be present in a special way during this service. In Christ's name and for his sake, amen. in a most remarkable moment, a moment like no other. For through that segment of time, a spectacular thing occurred. God became a man. Divinity arrived. Heaven opened herself and placed her most precious one in a human womb. The omnipotent, in one instant, became flesh and blood. The one who was larger than the universe became a microscopic embryo. And he who sustains the world with the word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God had come near. He came, not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. Mary and Joseph were anything but royal. Yet heaven entrusted its greatest treasure to these simple parents. It began in a manger this momentous moment in time. He looked anything but a king, his face purish and red, his cry still the helpless and piercing cry of a dependent baby, majesty in the midst of the mundane, holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. This baby had overseen the universe. These rags keeping him warm were the robes of eternity. His golden throne room had been abandoned in favor of a dirty sheep pen, and worshiping angels had been replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. Curious, this throne room. No tapestries covering the windows, no velvet garments on the courtiers, no golden scepter or glittering crown. Curious, the sounds in the court. Cows munching, hooves crunching, a mother humming, a babe nursing. It could have begun anywhere, the story of the king, but, curiously, it began in a manger. Step into the doorway. Peek through the window. He is here.
on the Savior. A group of climbers set out to scale a large mountain in Europe. The view boasted a breathtaking peak of snow-capped rocks. On clear days, the crested point reigned as king on the horizon. Its white tip jutted into the blue sky, inviting admiration and offering inspiration. On days like that, the hikers made the greatest progress. The peak stood above them like a compelling goal Eyes were called upward. The walk was brisk. The cooperation was unselfish. Though many, they climbed as one, all looking to the same summit. Yet on some days, the peak of the mountain was hidden from view. The cloud covering would eclipse the crisp blueness with the drab gray ceiling and block the vision of the mountaintop. On those days, the climb became arduous. Eyes were downward and thoughts inward. The goal was forgotten. Tempers short. Weariness was an uninvited companion. Complaints stung like thorns on the trail. We're like that, aren't we? As long as we can see our dream, as long as our goal is within eyesight, there is no mountain we can't climb or summit we can't scale. But take away our vision, block our view of the trail's end, and the result is as discouraging as the journey. Think about it. Hide the... Nazarene who calls to us from the mountaintop and see what happens. Listen to the groans of the climbers as they stop and sit by the side of the path. Why continue if there's no relief in sight? Pilgrims with no vision of the promised land become proprietors of their own land. They set up camp. They exchange hiking books for loafers and trade in their staffs for new recliners. Instead of looking upward at him, they look inward at themselves and outward at each other. The result? Cabin fever. Quarreling families, restless leaders, fence building, stake off territory. No trespassing signs are hung on hearts and homes. Spats turn into fights as myopic groups turn to glare at each other's weaknesses instead of turning to worship their common strength. Mark it down. We are what we see. If we see only ourselves, our tombstones will have the same epitaph Paul used to describe them en enemies of Christ. Their God is their own appetite. They glory in their shame. And this world is the limit of their horizon. Humans were never meant to dwell in the stale fog of the lowlands with no vision of their creator. That's why God came near, to be seen. And that's why those who saw him were never the same. We saw his glory, exclaimed one follower. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, whispered a martyr. They saw the peak. They breathed the fresh air of the high country. They caught a glimpse of the pinnacle. And they refused to quit climbing until they reached the top. They wanted to see Jesus. Seeing Jesus is what Christianity is all about. Christian service in its purest form is nothing more than imitating him who we see. To see his majesty and to imitate him, that is the sum of Christianity. This is why those who see him today are never the same again. Acquiring a vision of your maker can be like starting a whole new life. It can be like a new birth. In fact, the one who inspired this book said that new beginnings and good eyesight are inseparable. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. If Jesus is who he says he is, 
There is no truth more worthy of your time and no God more worthy of your devotion. Keep climbing and keep looking up, but make sure your eyes are on the Savior. Jesus came not only to give us hope for tomorrow, but peace and joy for today. In the midst of a world that can be so filled with discouragement, disappointment, sorrow, and uncertainty, God gives us Christmas. And in Christmas, God gives us the greatest gift of all, himself. Let's listen to the powerful words of the Apostle John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth.
God invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Heaven invites you to set the lens of your heart on the Savior and make him the object of your life. But what does it mean to see Jesus? The shepherds can tell us. For them, it wasn't enough to see the angels. You'd think it would have been. Night sky shattered with light, stillness erupting with song, simple shepherds roused from their sleep and raised to their feet by a choir of angels. Glory to God in the highest. Never had these men seen such splendor. But it wasn't enough to see the angels. The shepherds wanted to see the one who sent the angels. Since they wouldn't be satisfied until they saw him, you can trace the long line of Jesus seekers to a person who said, let's go, let's see. Not far behind the shepherds was a man named Simeon. Luke tells us Simeon was a good man who served in the temple during the time of Christ's birth and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. This prophecy was fulfilled only a few days after the shepherds saw Jesus. Somehow, Simeon knew that the blanketed bundle he saw in Mary's arms was the Almighty God. And for Simeon, seeing Jesus was enough. Now he was ready to die. Some don't want to die until they've seen the world. Simeon's dream was not so timid. He didn't want to die until he had seen the maker of the world. He had to see Jesus. He prayed, God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. The Magi had the same desire. They wanted to see Jesus. Like the shepherds, they were not satisfied with the spectacular star they saw in the night sky. To be a witness of the blazing orb was a privilege but for the Magi, it wasn't enough to see the light over Bethlehem. They wanted to see the light of Bethlehem. It was him they came to see. And they succeeded. They all succeeded. More remarkable than their diligence was Jesus' willingness. Jesus wants to be seen. They were all welcomed. Search for one example of one person who desired to see the infant Jesus and was turned away. You won't find it. I wonder if you'd be willing to do the same. What matters is that you want to know Jesus. Since God rewards those who truly want to find him, he welcomes you to come today. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, you are the light of Bethlehem and the light of my life. As I seek you, I want to see you and know you and fix my eyes upon you. I once was blinded by sin, but your grace has given me sight. May I behold you today in your beauty and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join with the angel chorus and worship Christ, the newborn King.
from the Applause of Heaven by Max Lucado. No man had more reason to be miserable than this one, yet no man was more joyful. His first home was a palace. Servants were at his fingertips. The snap of his fingers changed the course of history. His name was known and loved. He had everything, wealth, power, respect, and then he had nothing. Students of the event still ponder it. Historians stumble as they attempt to explain it. How could a king lose everything in one instant? One moment he was royalty, the next he was in poverty. His bed became at best a borrowed pallet, and usually the hard earth. He never owned even the most basic mode of transportation and was dependent upon handouts for his income. He was sometimes so hungry that he would eat raw grain. He knew what it was like to be rained on, to be cold. He knew what it was like to have no home. In his kingdom, he had been revered. Now he was ridiculed. His neighbors tried to lynch him. Some called him a lunatic. His family tried to confine him to their house. Those who didn't ridicule him tried to use him. They wanted favors. They wanted tricks. He was a novelty. They wanted to be seen with him. That is, until it was, it was out of fashion being with him. Then they wanted to kill him. He was accused of a crime he had never committed. Witnesses were hired to lie. The jury was rigged. No lawyer was assigned to his defense. A judge, swayed by politics, handed down the death penalty. They killed him. He left as he came, penniless. He was buried in a borrowed grave, his funeral financed by compassionate friends. Though he had once had everything, he died with nothing. He should have been miserable and bitter. He had every right to be a pot of boiling anger, but he wasn't. He was joyful, joyful when he was poor, joyful when he was abandoned and betrayed, even joyful when he was hung on a tool of torture, his hands pierced with six-inch Roman spikes. What type of joy is this? I call it sacred delight. It is sacred because it is not of the earth. What is sacred is God's, and this joy is God's. It is delight because delight can satisfy and surprise. Delight is Bethlehem shepherds dancing a jig outside a cave. Delight is Mary watching God sleep in a feed trough. Delight is white-haired Simeon praising God who is about to be circumcised. What is sacred delight? It is God doing what gods would be doing only in your wildest dreams. Wearing diapers, riding donkeys, washing feet, dozing in storms. It's what you always dreamed but never expected. It's the too good to be true coming true. Think about God's joy, which consequences cannot quench. There is a delicious gladness that comes from God that cannot be stolen, a sacred delight. And it is within reach in the person of Jesus. Lord Jesus, you endured all that you did for the joy that was set before you. Then you sat down at the right hand of your Father. I praise you that I can believe in you today and enter into an inexpressible and glorious joy. My delight is in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shepherds kept their watching for signs.
God. He invited Mary to birth his son, the disciples to fish for men, the adulterous woman to start over, and Thomas to touch his wounds. God is the king who prepares the palace, sets the table, and invites his subject to come in. In fact, it seems his favorite word is come. Come, let us talk about these things. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be as white as snow. All you who are thirsty, come and drink. Come to me, all of you who are tired and have heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Come to the wedding feast. Come and follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. God is a God who invites. God is a God who calls. God is a God who opens the door and waves his hand, pointing pilgrims to a full table. His invitation is not just for a meal, however. It is for life. An invitation to come into his kingdom and take up residence in a tearless, graveless, painless world. Who can come? Whoever wishes. The invitation is at once universal and personal. To know God is to receive his invitation not just to hear it, not just to study it, not just to acknowledge it, but to receive it. It is possible to learn much about God's invitation and never respond to it personally. Yet his invitation is clear and non-negotiable. He gives us all and we give him all, simple and absolute. He is clear in what he asks and clear in what he offers. The choice is up to us. Isn't it incredible that God leaves the choice to us? Think about it. There are many things in life we can't choose. We can't, for example, choose the weather. We can't control the economy. We can't choose whether or not we are born with a big nose or blue eyes or a lot of hair. We can't even choose how people respond to us. But we can choose where to spend eternity. The big choice God leaves to us. The critical decision is ours. That is the only decision that really matters. Whether or not you take the job transfer, transfer is not critical. Whether or not you buy a new car is not crucial. What college you choose or what profession you select is important, but not compared to where you spend eternity. That decision you will remember. It is a choice of a lifetime. Wherever you are today and however you're doing in your faith journey, we invite you this Christmas to come.
Let us pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, the turkey dinner, the presents, and the celebrations are now complete. And some of us are so glad that this COVID Christmas can now be a part of history. But Lord, we know that Christmas is never really over. The most precious gift of your Son, Jesus, remains not just today, but every day. So let us come, whether for the first time or for the hundredth time. Let us come and adore him. Let us come and receive him. Let us come and worship him with all we are and all we have. Christmas Day may be over, but let the great gift of your Son shine bright and true through every day of this new year before us. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we go out from this service, I know that we're in our homes um, and maybe in person at the church, but as we go out from this service, we continue to worship God wherever we are, and we continue to serve Him as we meet people in our world. May the peace of Christ, the love of God, and the communion of God's Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you as you love and serve Him in our world. Amen.